In this video, I'm going to talk about software architecture, why it's at least as important as design patterns or principles, and how it makes the difference between great code and code that frankly just sucks. If you're new here and you want to become a better software developer, gain a deeper understanding of programming in general, start now by subscribing and hitting the bell so you don't miss anything. I notice many people treat Python like a tool to quickly hack together something. Don't get me wrong, it works great for that. And it's perfectly fine if you're just writing a simple script to clean up some data once. But as soon as you want to write code that's not used only once, code that's used by others, you're developing a library for a particular set of tasks, you need to think about software architecture. Overall, you can think of code organization on three levels. On the lowest level, you're choosing particular syntax elements or solutions for a specific problem. Do I use a for loop or a while loop? What algorithm do I choose for sorting this list? Do I store this data in an array, in a dictionary, as a string, etc. On top of that, you have the software design principles and design patterns. How do you structure everything in functions and classes? I've talked a lot about this in other videos in this series, using things like the strategy or the observer pattern, writing code that reduces coupling, making sure each part of your code has a single responsibility. But then on top of that, you have another layer which defines the overall philosophy or approach of how your code works and how it solves the main problem. That's called the software architecture. For example, let's take a look at a platform like Django. It's a very well-known Python platform, and if you look under the hood, it'll surely use lots of design patterns and specific solutions. But there's also an overarching approach, that's the Django way of doing things. It expects you to write templates for representing your content. It provides useful tools for working with data more easily. That's the architecture of the software. In the case of Django, you could call it a model view template architecture, because those are the three main components of the platform. If you want to know more about Django's particular architecture, I put a link to an interesting article in the description below. A very common software architecture is model view controller. Django's architecture partly follows that, but it's different in that the controller part is not explicit in Django. Instead, Django distinguishes between the view as a collection of the data that will be presented and the template that describes how it's going to be presented to the user. Model view controller splits the software into three parts. The model deals with the data. The view is a presentation of the model in a particular format. And the controller is the logic that binds the two. Let's take a look at an example. This is an example of an application that generates IDs. I'm using the TK Inter library here. It's pretty straightforward. There's a frame, it has a label, it has a list of IDs that you generated, and it has two buttons, one to generate an ID and another to clear the list of IDs you already generated. And these buttons are linked with two functions that are part of the same class, one for generating the actual ID. I'm using the UUID library for this and then simply insert that ID at the end of the list. And then I have another function for clearing the list. When I run this example, this is what you get. So here I have my interface. I can click on this generate UUID button to generate IDs and I can clear the list again. So it's really basic. The problem with the example is that everything is in a single class. So all the user interface stuff, managing the list of UUIDs itself, and also the functions that perform the actions when the user clicks on the buttons. Model view controller can help you separate these things. And if you look in this application, you see that these three parts are very clearly there. We have the view part, which is actually this part of the application. We have the model part, which is this part, which stores the data. And we have the controller part, and that's actually these things. So we can use model view controller to split these things into separate parts so you can more easily change them or extend them. As a first step, let's move out this list of UUIDs into a separate model class. So very simple, we have a class model and it simply contains a list of UUIDs. The second thing you want to do is separate the user interface stuff as well and that then becomes the view. And the user interface stuff that's basically everything that's written here. So let's create a separate class where we handle this. So I'm going to create a class called 
TK view where all the view stuff is going to be in there. In this class, I'm going to create a separate setup method that's going to create the user interface for me. And I'll just copy everything that I got here in the original version of the class. Now later on, I'm going to replace these function calls by something else because that's actually something that the controller is going to handle for me. So let's assume we have a controller that has those functions. I will add them later, but I'll already add it here as a parameter. And then instead of calling these functions on the object itself, I'm calling it on the controller. Next to creating the user interface, we also need some way to interact with it. In this case, the interactions are pretty basic. There are basically two of them. One is we want to add things to the list in the user interface and we want to be able to clear the list. So let's add two functions that can do that for us. So this is a simple function to append something in the list in the user interface and we're going to add the similar function for clearing the list. So the only responsibility of this class again is to control what is shown in the user interface. So we're setting it up and we're changing the user interface with a couple of simple functions. And finally, there's one more thing we need to do is that we need to be able to tell the user interface system to start the main loop so that the interface is actually shown to the user. And that's yet another function. Now obviously the view needs a controller of some sort and that controller has to have two functions, one for handling when you generate a UUID and one for handling when you want to clear the list. As a next step, let's build that controller. The controller binds the model and the view. So that means that when you create the controller, you should actually provide it with a model and the view that it can work with. Let's do that in the initializer. In the initializer, we get a model and a view and we store that inside the controller. The first thing that the controller needs to do is set up the whole system and then start the application. Let's add a function that handles that for us. And the only thing the control needs to do here is set up the view, so the user interface is uh, created and start the main loop. And the setup function in the view part, which is here, expects a controller. So I'm going to pass it this controller. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is we start the main loop. Now, the only thing we still need to do is add the functions that handle generating UUIDs and clearing the list of UUIDs. I'm just going to copy them over from the original example. In this function, we first need to generate a UUID and then next we need to add it to the list and user interface. So first we need to work with the model and then we need to work with the view. So I'm going to replace these two lines with one line of code that does something with the model and another line that does something with the view. What we need to append is the last element that we created and we get that from the model. And then this is the complete function in the controller. And similarly, we can do something for clearing the list. Now I'm going to remove the original code because obviously we don't need this part anymore. And now you see we have a model, a controller, and a few. And the only thing I need to do as a last part in this application is patch that all together. I'm creating the controller and as a parameter I'm giving it the model and the view. And then as a last step I need to call the start function. And now when I run the program we get exactly the same. So I generate a couple of IDs and I can clear the list. 
except that now it follows the model view controller architecture. There's a few things we can do to improve this a bit more. For example, at the moment, the controller is directly dependent on a TK view, which is a TK inter specific thing. What you can do is create an abstract class for the view as well. And then the controller depends on the abstract class instead of directly on the view that's specific for uh, TK inter. And inside that abstract class, we simply define the basic things that we're going to need in the controller. So that's setting up the user interface, appending something to the list, clearing the list, and finally starting the main loop. And then the only thing that's left to do is make view, TK view, a subclass of view. And then you could even make it explicit in the controller what kind of things you're expecting. So here we're expecting something of type view and here we're expecting something of type model. You could do the same thing that we did for the view with the model as well. So we could also create here an abstract class. In this case, the model is really simple, so I'm not doing it here, but you could. All right, so we have the model, we have the view, and we have the controller. And then we have the TK inter specific implementation of the view. So this is a nice way of separating these different things in our application. Model view controller is the software architecture. So within model view controller, it's perfectly possible that you will have other design patterns or design principles that you're going to apply. For example, in this case, when we generate a UID, we simply call directly this function to generate the UID. But you could imagine that we want different options for this. And one way to do that is obviously with something like a strategy pattern. So let's implement a simple functional version of the strategy pattern. I showed that also in one of my previous videos. So to start, I'm just gonna define a couple of functions that generate a variety of different IDs. So this is version one. And it uses the UUID1 function to generate the UUID. I'm also going to include the one that we originally used in this example, which is UUID4. And let's add an even simpler one where we're just generating a string containing random characters. There we go. So now we have three options, UUID1, UUID4, or a simple string ID. So since this is a job for the controller to manage these functions, we're gonna add an extra parameter here that is one of these functions. And we're going to store that in the controller object. There we go. And then instead of directly calling this function here, I'm going to call the generate UID function that I just stored. And then when I patch up the entire application, we have the controller that gets the model and the view. I can also pass it now a specific UID generation function. Let's do this one, for example. So if I start the application, I get UUID1 IDs. But now I can change it very simply. I can just change this function there. That's the power of the strategy pattern, obviously. And now it generates simple string IDs. And this is really nice because now I didn't have to change anything in the view. I didn't have to change anything in the controller code because I'm using the strategy pattern. So I can simply supply a different strategy. But the overall architecture is still model view controller. So now we have a very clear example of these three levels that I mentioned in the beginning of this video. We have the architecture level, which is model view controller. We have the design level, which in this case uses a functional strategy pattern. And we have the more low level where we're choosing particular syntax structures or whatever to, to do what we want the program to do. For example, here I'm using uh, lists and here I'm choosing particular functions like random.choices and join to generate this ID. Next to model view controller, there are many other software architectures. For example, another commonly used one is the pipeline. 
A pipeline is often used to model processing sequences. For example, many image processing libraries, including Scikit Image in Python or Sharp in the Node ecosystem, follow the pipeline architecture. Other examples of architectures are client-server, peer-to-peer, microservices, which is really common in bigger web applications nowadays, or game engines that have a game loop architecture. When you design a piece of software, it's good to be aware that these patterns exist. And optimally, you should make a choice before you start coding away, because the architecture you choose is going to determine whether your code is any good. You can write great code with low coupling, strong cohesion, lots of nice design patterns, but if the architecture is wrong, it doesn't matter. There's not always such a clear choice though. Both Angular and Django are web frameworks, but Angular is a pure MVC architecture, whereas Django follows the model template view architecture. I'm actually not much of a fan of model view controller, because it tends to favor designs where the software is simply a view on the database. So the software will allow you to create, read, update and delete things. But then you're thinking from the system perspective, maybe the user wants to do something else that doesn't fit into that strict idea. And in the end, it's all about what your user actually needs. Often, especially if you rely on existing frameworks, the software architecture choice is made for you. If you have to make a choice between frameworks though, make sure you understand their architectures, because that's what's going to decide how your application will fit together. I've put a link in the description to an article discussing a number of different software architectures that I think you'll like. Let me know in the comments what software architectures you're using and how they impact your work. Make sure to subscribe and check out the Discord server. There's an invitation link in the description below. Thanks for watching, take care and see you soon.